This video is sponsored by Mubi. Why is it green, do you think? The night. Yes. Why is the green night green? At almost the exact halfway point in the green night, there's an achingly slow 360 degree pan. Just before this shot, Gawain, who is on a quest, the purpose of which neither he nor the viewers really seem to understand, is waylaid by thieves and left tied up on the ground in the forest to die. The pace of this pan creates suspense. You feel what's coming at the other end of the pan must be important. But the real beauty of the pan is that you slowly realize what you're going to see at the end of it before you get there. As it progresses, winter turns to spring, time is passing, and you realize that only two options are available for the outcome of this shot. Gawain will either have escaped or he's going to be a corpse. And as the pan progresses even further, you realize which of these outcomes it will be. Before you even see the result, you hear it. I will do it. I will meet him. Gawain has engaged in a bizarre game. On Christmas Day, a green knight shows up in King Arthur's court with a challenge. He will fight a willing opponent, and if this opponent can land a blow against him, in one year's time, the green knight will return that blow. You understand this challenge? I do. I think I do. This is a bizarre film based on a bizarre story from the 14th century and director David Lowry's adaptation, which heavily modifies the original text, leans into the weirdness. There's a lot of different themes it explores and a lot of symbolic imagery. Gawain is struggling with becoming a knight, what it means to be a man, his mommy issues, his responsibility to his lover, etc. But the thing Lowry is most preoccupied with in the film is the thing that the Green Knight himself symbolizes. In the forest, for a moment Lowry gives us a glimpse of one possible outcome of the story, one where Gawain dies on the forest floor. But no sooner does he give us this glimpse than he spins the camera back around, effectively winding back the clock he just wound forward. And there we find Gawain still alive and he's able to free himself. But why is so much time spent on this moment? What is up with this shot? Is this a bizarre red herring? Some kind of fake out pseudo twist? If so much time is spent on this moment, surely it must play a significant role in understanding the story. How about me, Green Knight? What is the true nature of the game Gawain is playing? At every step, he seems unsure, and the people around him don't offer much consolation or guidance. But one thing seems clear. The Green Knight said he would deliver back whatever blow was given him, and we know what this means for Gawain. Gawain knows he's walking towards his own death. And if death awaits me. And while a lot of the people around him seem sure that there will be something after his meeting with the Green Knight. I mean your journey home. After he himself is not so sure. And it's assumed by all that just not playing the game, skipping out on his date with the Green Knight at the chapel, isn't even an option. Do you believe in magic? This is a film that will make zero sense if you look at it in a very literal way. In witchcraft, do you believe in it? Yes, I do. It's all around us. The world that Gawain inhabits is an enchanted one. Lowry imbues the film with a sense of this enchantment. Look around you, young Gawain. What you see. In moments like this one, see how he cuts to a pendant around someone's neck. I see legends. For seemingly no reason. 
It's moves like this in the editing and with the camera work that emphasize the symbolic, magical nature of the story. To understand the film, we have to look at the game Gawain is playing symbolically. And to understand what the game Gawain is playing symbolizes, we need to know what the Green Knight, at least in Lowry's universe, symbolizes. The green is the color of earth, of living things, of life. And of rot. Yes. In this moment, the lady of the house lays on the table the key to understanding the Green Knight. Lowry deftly links this monologue to the earlier scene of Gawain's death in the forest by bringing the same audio cues into the mix. In both scenes, we hear birdsong indicating spring, flies indicating decay, wind, and thunder. When you go, your footprints will fill with grass. Moss shall cover your tombstone, and as the sun rises, green shall spread over all. In all its shades and hues. This verdict we will overtake your swords, and your coins, and your battlements, and try as you might, all you hold dear will succumb to it. Your skin. Your bones. The green of the green night is the green of decay, of time. It's the new life that springs out of death and covers over it. It's the green that no armor or knightly station can defend against. I live in the midst of the Appalachian Mountains, which are said to be some of the oldest mountains on earth. Geologists say that these mountains were once taller than the Himalayas, but have been worn down by time. In contrast to younger mountain ranges that are still forming like the Himalayas, the Appalachian Mountains are much smaller and much greener. In Facing the Green Knight, Gawain is facing his own death, but not his literal death at the hands of the knight himself, his inevitable, inescapable death at the hands of time, a death that will happen no matter what he does in this life. Vänta ett ögonblick. Så säger ni alla. Men jag lämnar inga uppskor. Du spelar ju schack, inte sant? In Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, another medieval period piece about a knight playing a game for his life, there's an interesting moment towards the middle of the film. A monk interrupts a play being performed by a traveling stage troupe to deliver these remarks. Vi ska alla förgås i den svarta döden. Ni som står där som gapande fekreatur och ni som sitter i dästa självbelåtenhet vet ni att detta kan vara er sista timme. It's hard not to see the monk as interrupting not just the play in the film but the film itself to deliver a message that Bergman wants us to hear. A very real message about our own mortality and the necessity of confronting it. This moment in the woods this long pan isn't just about portraying Gawain's own vision of his death if he doesn't act to save himself. It's a period of time that Lowry gives us to contemplate death itself, the passing of time, and our own mortality. Lowry isn't just putting death on screen as a plot point, he's confronting us with it and he wants us to think about it. He's done this before in his work. His film A Ghost Story is essentially a guided meditation on grief, death, and time. It has very little dialogue, but around the halfway point, this guy interrupts the film to deliver a tirade about death and decay and the ultimate meaninglessness of everything in the face of the destruction of the universe at the hands of time. Your kids are gonna die, yours too, yours too. Hey, just saying, they're all gonna die. It's a move that is a huge turnoff. Nobody likes this guy. Lowry's direction seems to even acknowledge that. This character is literally the you must be fun at parties trope. His shirt is sweat-stained and the people around him don't seem that interested in what he has to say. While I like a ghost story, it's not at all subtle in its exploration of these themes. I think Lowry found a more interesting way to force the audience to ponder death in The Green Knight. But people still hate this stuff. At least two people walked out of the screening of The Green Knight I was in. Both movies have a lot of detractors. Many don't like them simply because they're weird and slow or it's not their thing, but I think a decent number of people just don't like a downer. They don't want to think about death, much less in a theater where they came to escape. 
But whether you see meaninglessness in the face of death or believe in something that transcends death or offers meaning in spite of it, it's a reality everyone has to face. Is this really all there is? Is this? What else ought there be? Gawain, like most of us, is not that interested in confronting his own death. And luckily, he is given an enchanted cord to tie around his waist. As long as he wears it there, no harm can come to him. He uses it at the end of the film to escape the Green Knight in the chapel and live out his life, becoming king, marrying, and having children. And once again, Lowry presents us with a slow, 360 degree pan followed by another image of Gawain's death as he decides to remove the cord. As he removes the cord he is beheaded showing us he never really escaped the Green Knight's blow. His death of old age is the same death he faced in the chapel. Both deaths are the same. Both are deaths at the hand of time. Lowry once again rewinds the time he wound forward, and we find Gawain still in the Green Chapel, alive. Wait. Gawain realizes there is no escaping the Green Knight. Even if he flees the chapel, time and decay will eventually catch up with him. The game is not about escaping the Green Knight, but about your attitude in the face of your own death. Is it possible to win that game? Lowry leaves it somewhat ambiguous. But I think for Gawain, his acceptance of death in the chapel offers him a kind of freedom. After he removes the cord, making himself vulnerable to the Green Knight, the Green Knight allows him to go free without taking the blow in the chapel. We know he can't truly escape death and decay, but now he faces life with courage. I'm ready now. The Green Knight is green because he represents the new life that comes forth out of death. In finding the courage to face his death, Gawain finds courage to live his life. The Green Knight is very weird, and if that's your thing and you want to go even further into the weirdness and the symbolism, you could check out Jodorowsky's The Holy Mountain, which is available right now in the US on MUBI, my sponsor for this video. MUBI is an online streaming cinema that is hand curated. Every day they add a new film with an explanation of why it's worth your time. I love MUBI. I've been watching stuff on there for a long time. They're a great way to find new independent art house, classic, and international cinema. MUBI's amazing hand curated library is available all around the world and you can try it for free for 30 days right now when you click the link in the description to sign up for your extended free trial. Go to MUBI.com slash Thomas Flight, that's M-U-B-I dot com slash Thomas Flight, or click the link on the screen to get 30 days of MUBI for free. If you want more insight into what I watch every month in my Patreon podcast, I give quick, spoiler-free reviews of every movie that I watch. Get access to this and support my channel when you sign up to become a patron at patreon.com slash thomasflight.